What did you make of the Biden administration's responses to Russia's proposals when they called for neutrality for Ukraine and for a rolling back of offensive weapon systems uh, inside Eastern Europe? My reading of it is there was some flexibility. For example, you mentioned inspections of U.S. Uh, missile sites in Poland and Romania. I, I could have it wrong, but I believe the Biden administration signaled some potential openness to that. I'm wondering what you think of, of how Biden responded and also Putin's decision to invade. Do you think that he had other options? And strategically, from a Russian point of view, was this strategically the right move? Or do you think there was possibly more room for diplomacy, not only on uh, NATO and missiles, but also on the status of the Donbass and the war there? Well, I think uh, the, the one voice of reason in the Biden administration is the CIA director uh, or the National Intelligence uh, Director, and that is William Burns. Uh, he has always been a voice of reason on the subject of Russia, and he has tried to, uh, what's the right word, modulate uh, the Russian uh, hate that is so prevalent. But again, he's being crushed by those who see Russia as something that has to be denationalized, much as the left is denationalizing the United States as a place whose borders have to be open to allow mass migration from the developing world into Russia. All of these things are part and parcel of the reasons people hate, hate Russia. And of course, Russia declares itself to be a, an Orthodox Christian country. That's completely unacceptable because atheism, nihilism, multiculturalism, uh, all of these things are are caught up together, and there is a vile hatred for anybody who uh, thinks the kinds of things that exist in Russia could be remotely positive in any way. Uh, William Burns has tried to push back against that. He's tried to reason with people about it. It hasn't worked very well. But I think there was a chance for a short time. Now, Putin, from where he sits, looks at what's going on. He's aware of the things that we're discussing. But he also saw a large troop buildup in eastern Ukraine, approximately 60,000 troops that were poised to strike at the Donbass, at Luhansk and Donetsk. And I think he was persuaded that this would happen and that obviously the Donetsk and Luhansk republics and their population would be destroyed. And he could not sit by and tolerate that. I also think he thought that there was no hope, that every time he tried to make the case, which he did several times, no one would listen to him. Somebody said, well, the reason this didn't happen under Donald Trump was that Donald Trump is strong and no one would challenge him. It had a lot less to do with that than Trump's private willingness to listen to Mr. Putin's position. What, what disappointed Putin and I think many others was Donald Trump's inability to get control of his own administration. He appointed people that were absolutely opposed to him and his thinking. So from the moment he opened his mouth and said, why can't we have a better relationship with Russia? He was sabotaged and subverted. Putin realized that. Then I think he waited to see how Biden would respond. And of course, you know that Biden was bragging about how he told uh, Putin that he was a vicious killer and a thug, how proud he was of insulting the man to his face and denigrating him and, and what he's done inside Russia. Uh, I think you put that together with the buildup in the East and I think he felt Russia was genuinely, genuinely threatened. And he thought it was only a matter of time until something akin to the Pershing II missiles that we once had on the ground in Germany would show up in eastern Ukraine. And we can all sit here and say, oh, well, that wouldn't have happened. But he had a lot of reason to believe that it would for the reasons we've already discussed, the NATOization of things. Uh, and that's the kind that, remember, the Pershing II was a hypersonic missile. You know, you're talking a few minutes and it lands in Moscow. And he kept telling people this. No one would listen. And there was no willingness to, to reassure him and his government in any way, shape, or form that this was not the intention. So I think he rightly concluded he didn't have much choice. And I think the biggest mistake that he's made, if he's made any with this operation, so I, th I think he's tried to be too careful. And I think it's tragic. But when you, when you do what he's done with his force, you try very hard to avoid unnecessary civilian casualties and avoid damage you end up in the position he's in. This thing has lasted three weeks, longer than, than he would have liked. It creates opportunities for your enemies, for your opponents to, to meddle in, in what's happening. It gives false hope to people on the other side. That's the problem, and that's what he's up against. And I'm sure he's heard that from his inner circle. I'm sure some of his senior officers have said that. And uh, if you try to convince anybody in the United States, by the way, 
that Vladimir Putin was remotely concerned about the loss of civilian life in Ukraine, well, they'll laugh you off the stage. That's impossible. He's evil. He's terrible. He's bad. It's a lot of nonsense. He was, and he still is, I think. I think he would like to get an agreement because I don't think he wants anything to do with going into Kiev. Kiev. Yeah. <laughs> That's the last option. I mean, if you look at it right now, uh, Kharkiv and Kiev are, are about it. The cauldron uh, has to be dealt with, and they're still laying siege to Mariupol, but I'm afraid, given the enemy that they have cornered there, the 3,000 Azov members, they're probably going to reduce it and be done with it. But that's clearly not what he wants in Kharkiv. That's clearly not what he wants in Kiev. But if he can't get somebody to put their name on the agreement and agree to those basic terms, then I suppose he's going to act. <laughs> 